In this video, I'll explain the sarcomere and its associated physiology. This is an extremely confusing topic that in my experience, most medical students and other graduate health professionals just punt and don't really bother studying. But on your exams, the sarcomere makes up a significant number of physiology questions. And so because I think it's a very simple topic to learn, if you just take a little bit of time and simplify it, it can actually be free points. So that's what I'll do in this video. We will simplify things so that when you hear sarcomere, you're not trembling with dread because of all of the different elements of the sarcomere that you don't want to learn. But instead, you've watched my you know few minute video here and you're feeling confident and able to answer these questions. So let's get started. What I'm going to do first is just draw what a sarcomere looks like and we'll label everything. Lots of textbooks are very bad at this part. They, they, they are very overwhelming because there are admittedly lots of components of the sarcomere. But I think if we keep this simple, it's gonna make perfect sense. So there are two different proteins that we're gonna start with. You see the thin area in blue, that's actin, and the thick area in red, that is myosin. So in a normal sarcomere, the myosin, which again is thicker and in red, and the actin, which is thinner and in blue, these overlap. And it's these overlapping proteins that are gonna grab onto to one another and pull. And that's what causes muscle contraction. So from a really 100 foot view, if you wanted to walk away from the sarcomere physiology knowing one thing, you need to know that it's the myosin and the actin telescoping and contracting and pulling on one another that leads to muscle contraction. So that's the big takeaway here. But myosin, again, shown in red, that's your thick filament, so it will appear thicker. The actin, shown in blue, that's your thin filament, and that's, that's going to appear thinner. So under a microscope, the thicker, darker substance is the myosin, and the thinner, lighter substance is the actin. Now, the way to memorize this, to know which one's thin and which one's thick, is that instead of saying actin, say actin. Actin. So that way you know that actin is actin. It's the thin filament. So it's the thinner, lighter one under the microscope, and then myosin is the thicker, darker one under the microscope. Sometimes I say myothick and act actin, but I think you can just walk away from this saying actin, and that's good enough because then by the process of elimination, if it's actin, then you know that myosin is thick. Now on the very ends of where the actin is there are two Z bands. Sometimes these are called Z discs, but they're the same thing. They mark the end of the actin, okay? And so what I want you to memorize here is that Z bands are Z end of the actin. And that's how you memorize that Z equals Z end, Z end of the actin. So the end of where that thin, the thin filament, that actin, where that ends, that's your Z band because it's Z end, okay? So it's shown in green here in my diagram. Now the next area that you need to know is the I band. The I band is the area where there is only actin but no myosin. So where the myosin or thick filament ends between that point and the Z band, which again is the Z end of the actin, that area in between, that is your I band. And to be abundantly clear, what I'm referring to is this area shown in purple. And you can see when I superimpose these purple rectangles, over that area where the I band is in purple, again, that is your I band, okay? So it only is where there's actin, but no myosin. So that's your I band, okay? So, so here's where we are, hopefully not too overwhelming yet. Again, just to sort of summarize the four elements we've talked about, myosin is your thick filament shown in red. Under a microscope, it's thicker and darker. Actin is your thin filament shown in blue. Under a microscope, because it's thinner, it's lighter, and we memorize actin as actin. Your Z band is Z end of the actin, so it is the um, lateral most portions where the actins kind of terminate in this single unit. And then our I bands are where we have only isolated actin, and that's our mnemonic for I bands, I for isolated. It's the isolated area where only actin exists, between where the myosin ends and the z-band on the outside okay so and that was shown in purple here so the next area that we need to know on the sarcomere is the a-band okay the a-band is the entire length that the myosin runs so you can see that it's shown in orange here so it's basically the entire length of the sarcomere that the myosin runs and so technically it's it's yes it's the length of the myosin but it has a length 
that captures some myosin and some actin. Okay, but it but the lengthwise it's from myosin left to myosin right or maybe right to left depending on which direction you're looking. But again, it's shown in orange here. And the way that I want you to remember this is that when you think of A, I want you to think what a sin. What like there's an expression that people say they go, "Ah, oh, what a sin." And the reason that you say that is because what a sin or what a sin reminds you of A band and sin for myosin. So the A band is the entire length of myosin. So what A for A band, sin for myosin. A band runs the whole myosin length. So that's shown here in orange. So we're not quite done yet, but I want to kind of nudge you and, and ask, is this as overwhelming as you thought it was when you were trying to learn this from a really crappy overpriced resource? Probably not. So let's keep going. The next area of the sarcomere you need to know is the H zone. Now the H zone is the area directly in the middle and that area only contains myosin. So look over the center of our sarcomere structure right now. You see that center area right here where the brown rectangle is shown. And if I superimpose that behind the areas that could potentially have um, thick or thin filament, you can see that this area only contains myosin because the actin terminates before the H zone. So the H zone has myosin running across it, but it does not have any actin. This is the H zone. And I want you to memorize this by saying it has only myosin. The H in has for H zone, okay? And it's shown here in brown. So here's where we are, and we only have one more thing to learn, and it's the easiest on the entire sarcomere. And that's the M line. And the M line goes straight down the middle, the center of the H zone, and the M line, you, the easiest way to, to memorize this is just calling it the midline. I don't know if that's where the M is derived from. I'm sure it's some German word that I don't know, but, but midline is how I memorize this. So M line goes right down the middle of the H zone, right down the center of the sarcomere. And that's your M line. And in my sarcomere, that's shown here in teal. So this is really all you need to know as far as the individual components go. Where it gets challenging on exams is that they're going to show you most likely a picture of a sarcomere under a microscope, which is what you see on the bottom of my slide here. And so translating the theoretical image that I have created for you and applying that to an actual image of, of something under a microscope is a little bit challenging. So, so what I would recommend doing is spend a little time on this slide and the next slide, which I'll go to in one second, to familiarize yourself with what it actually looks like. Because what you can see here is that those Z lines or those Z discs, they are the you know, Z end of the actin, as I, my mnemonic says, but in your brain, you need to get used to the fact that there's other sarcomere units outside of the single one that you're looking at. So under a microscope, you see the Z disc or the Z band, but outside of it, there's obviously more structure because that's a different unit. And you can see, like I said before, in the center of this image across the A band, it's darker. That's because the thick filament or the myosin is quite dark. And then beyond that, where the actin is, you can see that it's lighter in that section where the I band is. So take some time, pause the video, look at this slide and compare it to this slide and I want you to get familiar with what these things look like under a microscope. Because a classic test question is going to show you this image and it's gonna label various parts and it's gonna have like A, B, C, D, and E. And then you're gonna get a test question, which of the following structures does the letter C represent, for example? And so you need to be able to answer this. So it's a simple labeling question, but I do think that if you learn my mnemonics and spend a little bit of time, it is free points and we don't want to leave free points on the table because that's how we can pass these exams. So this is what you need to know. Again, if you're if it's a little confusing or I went through it too quickly, pause the video and spend some time. But I think if you memorize my mnemonics here, it's kind of easy. Again, let's walk through it really, really briefly. So as far as the filaments go, we've got myosin, which is thick and actin. Actin is thin. We have Z band or Z disc, which is Z end of the actin. The I band is I for isolated. That's only where there's actin. The A band, what A sin, meaning the A band is myosin all the way across. H zone, H for has only myosin. And then M is your mid line. If you can do that in the 20 seconds I've just done it, you got free points. 
all right? So now that you understand the different components of the sarcomere, let's talk about some physiology. So there's this concept that you need to know called the sliding filament theory. Now basically this refers to the theory of muscle contraction, whereby actin and myosin slide past one another in a coordinated contraction relaxation cycle. Basically actin and myosin proteins are latching onto one another, sliding past each other, and when the sarcomere contracts and telescopes and shortens and then elongates, that movement causes muscular contraction. So this is the leading theory on how muscle contraction works. And it's got four different stages, attachment, power stroke, release, and cocking. We're gonna walk through these stages one at a time and conclude this video by talking about the muscle physiology here and how all of this works. So we start with attachment. And I've tried to color code everything here to make this easier for you to learn and memorize. So in attachment, the myosin head, again, myosin is our thick red filament, and the head is shown in that dark teal color. The myosin head is attaching to actin, and I'm just gonna use actin instead of actin to really hammer home my mnemonic. So myosin head is bound to actin, and it forms what's known as a cross bridge. So at this point, the myosin and actin are in a cross bridge, they're attached, they're ready to pull. And before that pull happens, which is known as the power stroke, which is the second phase of this physiology, phosphate and ADP are bound to the myosin head. So phosphate and ADP are basically going to provide the energy source for the power stroke. Now the next stage is power stroke. So in power stroke, I'm gonna show you two different slides here. You start with that myosin head attached to actin, and phosphate and ADP are going to be released from the head that's gonna provide a lot of energy here. And then the myosin head is going to pull that actin towards the M line. So we go from this to this. So I want you to kind of just focus on the right side here because I, I could have drawn the left side doing this and shortening as well. But the right side is really depicting how these things are sliding and moving. So when the power stroke happens, everything contracts and gets shorter. So the myosin head kind of turns, it pivots a little bit, it's pulling the actin toward the M line and phosphate and ADP are released from the myosin head. Okay, now this would also be happening on the left side. I just haven't shown it on this slide. Now we have release. In release, the myosin head is uncocked from the actin, from the actin so it's no longer grabbing onto actin. ATP binds to myosin, and it's really that ATP binding to myosin that allows the myosin head to release from the actin. In other words, you need ATP for muscle relaxation because if you don't have ATP, then myosin heads will not uncock from actin and you'll stay contracted. So a little clinical note here that I put at the bottom of the slide, this is actually really high yield and frankly just cool to know because this is the cause of rigor mortis. So when somebody dies and they're very like locked up in a full body muscle contraction, that's because after they die, if they have a lack of ATP, then they have no ATP to bind to the myosin head and release it from actin. So in other words, in the absence of ATP after somebody dies, myosin heads can stay stuck on actin. So they'll stay in this muscle contraction phase. So pretty cool, very, very cool to know. I don't think you need to necessarily know that for an exam, but really cool talking point. So that's release. The myosin head uncocks and ATP binds to myosin, promoting it to release from actin. And then the last stage is cocking. And in cocking, the myosin head is undergoing a conformational change. So it's basically going from a low energy state to a high energy state in anticipation of going through the whole cycle again and, and attaching. And in this case, the ATP that allowed the myosin head to release from the actin is hydrolyzed to ADP plus phosphate. And so you've got ADP plus phosphate reattached to the myosin head and now the myosin head is in a higher energy state, it's cocked and it's ready to attach to the actin and start the cycle all over again. So those are the four stages. Again, what you wanna know is attachment, power stroke, release, and cocking. These are the four stages of the sliding filament theory, which again, describes how actin and myosin slide past one another, shortening and elongating the sarcomere, promoting muscle contraction. So that's it for this video. Again, it's a very complex topic when you look at it at first glance, but if you spend a little bit of time, I do think that this can be some free points for you. So I hope you found this useful. Best of luck.